If this is your first time here at Freedom Church, you're figuring out really quick what we're all about, and we are honored that you are here and would spend some time worshiping Jesus with us and hearing from his word. Um, is there anybody out there that just got back from vacation, man? Like, you're like, I'm literally back from vacation. I wish I could go back, man. We're so happy that you guys are here with us today. And I want to look into the camera and welcome everybody that is on vacation at this time right here. Thanks for joining us from afar. Um, even if you're just joining us online from your living room, man, we're just super grateful that you are with us today. Um, and for those of you that I've not had the pleasure to meet yet, as was shared, my name is David. And I am super passionate about a lot of things, but I'm telling you, typically you're going to find me in my favorite part of the building, which is over there with the kids and with the kids team. Can we hear it for the kids team really quick, everybody? Come on. Freedom Kids team is in my opinion, and it's allowed to be in my opinion, the best team. I think that it's the best team. Um, but uh, Bethany and I are honored to uh, be the kids pastors here and lead that team. And I'm telling you, I want to share with you, parents, every week the kids team walks into that side of the building and in the different environments across all of Freedom Church and all of our locations, prepared to teach your kids that the Bible is relevant, that it's exciting, and that having a relationship with Jesus is the best decision that they could ever make. So it's just an honor to get to be a part of that team. And for you parents that are in the room, man, I, I'm just so proud of each and every one of you. Some of you are parents. Some of you are grandparents. Some of you are, you, you, the, the kid is not yours by blood, but you claim them as your own and take care of them. Thank you so much for being that person. It's an honor to partner with you week in and week out and to be a small part of leading your kids to know God, find freedom, discover purpose and to make a difference. And that comes from the youth team as well. Our entire next gen team is just honored to partner with you parents. And just one more uh, group of people that I wanna honor really quick are pastors Wade and Dawn and pastors Mark and Sherilyn. Man, thank you guys so much for leading this church so well. Thank you for being the kind of people that champion the next generation. And thank you for the opportunity to come in and talk to the big people. That is really the truth, man. I'm with the grown-ups today. It's a little weird, I'm not going to lie, but it's also exciting, okay? So I'm excited to be here. I hope that you're excited to be here. Like we said, we're starting this new sermon series, Summer Playlist. It's about putting our favorite Bible stories or like what God is teaching us right now on shuffle. So you're just going to be hearing from the heart of these different communicators during this series. And I get to launch us off in that here at Bel Air. But before we get into all of that, I would like to know, like, how many of you are vacation people? Like, you love it. You prepare for it. I'm a kid's pastor. Like, raise your hand. Like, say yes. Like, do something for me if that's you. I like participation. You're not going to distract me. It's, I mean, we were doing worship the other week, and, like, a kid's over there, like, kicking his brother's shin. And, you know, I'm, like, breaking that up. So you guys are great. Like, we're, we're in business right here. Vacations are so much fun. How many of you are the type of vacation people that it's the same every single year? Like, same restaurants, same place you go with the same people. You love the same. How many of you, it's like it changes up constantly, close to home, far from home, beach and then mountains, expensive and then cheap. Like you just really love the change of a vacation. And then there's a, a group of you out there that are like me. Vacations are good, but they make you a little nervous. You know, like you got to find a dog sitter and you got to, you got to go and you know, you're probably going to be a little more tired than when you left. You know, like it's one of those types, anybody like that out there make me feel, you make me feel a little bit better. All right. But for real vacations are wonderful. And the fact that we get to spend time with our family and friends, get out of our element a little bit, and we get to make some memories. Everybody love memories. I love memories. Maybe your memory is like sitting out on the front porch here and the waves hit the beach and drinking a cup of coffee. Maybe that's yours. Maybe you went off to the mountains and a bear broke into your truck like at Pigeon Forge. I don't know. You've all got stories about that. For me, I grew up going to the Outer Banks, okay, uh, to a place called Cape Hatteras. And my mom loves lighthouses, and you can go into the lighthouses up there. Blackbeard's Hideout is like a ferry ride away on Ocracoke. That's pretty cool. Um, but we would travel, the, the Reiner family, see, we would travel in style. We had one of these um, Southern Comfort Ford conversion vans, all right? And we took it everywhere. Yes, we had one just like that. It was gold, everything. We had two of them that I can remember. Um, but our license plate right there, it said Reinard, all right? Like you knew we were here. That's what we drove to school in the mornings, guys. And it was just my mom, me, and my brother. But we got a VCR and a DVD player, and we had CDs we could play in the back versus mom and dad CDs that they wanted to play in the front. It was a blast. And the back seat would like lay out into this bed, okay? This was the win. My dad would make a bed for us, 
and he would he would carry us out in in the the early morning and like lay us in the back of the seat and danger like all over this place. We would, me and my younger brother, we'd wake up riding down 81 like that. Like that's the way that we traveled. You just don't do that anymore. We were always prepared for a great trip. Me and Steven, we would pick out our favorite movies that, to have. Um, my, my dad would pack up all this food. My mom would do the suitcases and then we'd print out Google Maps, you know, Google Directions. You'd print them out and then off, off we would go um, and we would have a great time. So we were prepared for a great time. But then when you're in vacation, you have to respond while you're there, right? And there was something that happened that we were are not prepared for. I'm going to tell you. So um, at the Outer Banks, you can drive these, uh, your vehicles out onto the beach. My dad had this great idea that he was going to drive the conversion van out onto the beach. It was a great day. I remember playing with my cousins. I was little, y'all. I, I really wouldn't remember a ton about it. I'll show you why I can here in a minute. I played with my cousins. I remember that. My uncles were fishing. But when we were ready to leave, the van was not ready to leave. And uh, there we are. The Reinerd Mobile. Um, yeah, that was us. So we just spun the wheels. Dad was like, you want to dig in the sand a little bit? Here's a hole. Like, I mean, and then, um, but those are my uncles right there. Like they jumped in and they saved the day. My dad had a shovel in the van because he's just prepared. Why did he have a shovel? But that Dodge truck pulled up and attached to the van and then all these burly West Virginia men, my dad's from West Virginia, they got behind the van and they're pulling and tugging and picking up and pushing and we got out, we made it. But then there was this big response that had to happen, this big recovery, right? We had to clean out the van, we had to make sure that it was in good condition, like dad was making sure everything was fine, but we made it home, it was great. And then what happens? You just go back into another day, right? But it was such an iconic moment. Yes, we took a picture of it and then my older brother wrote a song about it. So like, that's the way that I remember this going down. It was a big thing. I'm not going to sing the song. It's on a cassette tape somewhere. Oh, I know. So sad. So three things from our trip that we can really lean into. And those of you that take trips, not just vacations, but trips, you're, you're going to prepare, you're going to respond, and you're going to recover. So let's say it together, everybody. Say prepare, respond, recover. Very good. And for those of you that travel often, you've got that down to a science. Well, back in Jesus' day, travel was no different, but the preparation was way different as far as like preparing. Like we see him at the age of 12 traveling to the temple with his mom and dad over a day's journey on foot. Like that was how Jesus grew up. And then there, uh, there's this time in his life in, in the book of Mark, you see him, he's here and then he's there. He heals someone here and then he goes off to pray and then he rides a boat across the, the Sea of Galilee. All these different travel experiences. Well, today we're gonna meet Jesus with one of his longest travels that he took, and it was 40 days into the wilderness, okay? But his preparation would have to be intentional. His response would be vital to our future, and his recovery would be easily overlooked, but not at all unimportant. So today we're talking about Jesus in the wilderness. And at the very beginning of the New Testament, this story is not talked about once, not talked about twice. It's talked about three times. And when my mama repeated something, it was important. All right. So that's where we're leaning into that. Um, and just for some quick context, we go back into the, the, the history of Israel and they're now used to being captives. Okay. At this point, they've been captives for a lot of different uh, for, for years, hundreds of years, but who's in charge of them right now are the Romans. Um, religious freedoms were in place, but taxes and the powers of the time just really took their toll on the people. But something really good came out of this time. It, it was, uh, in history, it's called the Pax Romana. In the Bible, it says, when the fullness of time had come. And that's the context that Jesus is growing up in. It was the most peaceful time in Roman history, all right? And that's where Jesus is growing up. That's his context. And so not much is known of his early life. We know that he uh, grew in wisdom and in stature um, with both God and man. Where are my 252 people at? Like, you, you know, yeah, 252, that's, that's their verse. So, um, but when Jesus was about 30 years old is where we really start to learn a lot about who he was. So Jesus is 30 years old. And if you have your Bibles today or your phones, you want to follow along, take some notes, you can use the screens as well. We're going to be in Matthew chapters 3 and four, Matthew chapters three and four. So let's start with Matthew chapter three, verse 13. Jesus's cousin, John the Baptist, he, um, he had been baptizing people who were repenting of their sins and choosing to follow God. Now, John knew that there was something special about Jesus. He believed him to be the Messiah. So when he saw Jesus heading his way one day, he noticed. 
So it says here, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to, be, uh, agreed to baptize him. And after his, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. That's iconic, right? Like that's a huge moment. Jesus' baptism. You've seen a picture of it. Anybody seen a picture of it? You've heard the story. You're in on it. After the baptism, you see the Holy Spirit come down on Jesus and you hear God say, this is my son and I'm proud of him. But now the fun starts. Jesus has been confirmed at that moment to be the Messiah. He's come to reconcile the human race back to God. So what naturally happens the devil gets involved, like immediately. He's like, man, before Jesus can even heal anyone or go do any miracles or prove that he's the son of God, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tempt him and I'm gonna make him fall. Because Satan knew that Jesus needed to be perfect without sin in order for this plan to work. So immediately, I'm gonna make him fall. So you're Satan for a second and you're thinking about this and you're like, okay, how am I gonna tempt, how am I gonna tempt Jesus of all people, the son of God? This is his game plan. He's gonna do what he did thousands of years ago in the Garden of Eden. He's gonna to appeal to Jesus' human side. Jesus was fully human, but he was fully God. And, and Satan's gonna lean into this and be like, man, I know that he's gonna struggle with the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, same as Adam and Eve. So I'm going for it. So here's what we do know out of this story. I wanna be very clear about this. The, the point of this story is not could Jesus have sinned? Okay, that's a good question. That's a great question. I had a professor that talked to us about it. He shared with us, he was like, um, now this is my professor speaking, okay? Some people left in the first gathering thinking I have a doctorate. I don't, my professor did. I don't have a doctorate. That is not David for you. Um, but my professor, he's talking to us and he's like, when I came in with my bachelor's, I firmly believed that Jesus could not have sinned because he was fully, he was fully God. And then he's like, I, I left my master's believing like Jesus could have sinned because, because he was fully man, right? But then he's like, but now that I have my doctorate, my professor speaking, everybody, now that I have my doctorate, I fully stand on the fact that I don't know. And he was very confident about that. And I tell, I tell you guys that because this is not the point of our story. Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't write this down for us to discuss that question. Their deal was this, Jesus did not sin. He was perfect. Now he was tempted, which is good news for you and me because it means temptation is not a sin, but it does mean that there's a way to overcome it. So what does Satan throw at him? It says, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil looked, uh, took him to the, the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot up against a stone. But Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to a peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I'll give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and you just worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And how did the devil respond? He went away. Now, what I want us to grasp here is that Jesus was tempted in every way in this moment as you and me. In 1 John, you're like, there's three things. I think I'm missing something. In 1 John, he, he tells us every way that we're able to be tempted, and it's through the lust of the flesh. Everybody say the flesh. The lust of the eyes. Everybody say eyes. And the pride of life. Everybody say pride. Okay, these are the three ways, and this is the way that he attacked Adam and Eve in the garden. It's the way that he attacked Jesus. So Jesus was tempted by, in those three ways. First, we see him really hungry. I don't do well without food, you guys. Like I, but Jesus was really hungry. So the devil plays tricky, and he's like, turn these, these rocks into bread. Not a sin. Jesus could have done it, right? 
He can change water into wine. Why can't he turn rocks into bread? The whole deal was Jesus had been fasting and putting his spirit man in charge of his body. And he was not going to allow Satan to tell him when it was time to break that fast. He was using self-control. Second, he's given the opportunity to arrogantly show everyone that matters. He's at the temple, all the religious leaders. He was going to show all of them that he was the son of God. You could just jump off of this place and levitate. It would be fine. But Jesus had to be so secure in who God said he was and say, God's plan is enough. I'm going to die, rise again from the dead, and that's enough. I don't need to prove myself to be the Messiah in any other way. And then we move into this other piece where he, he struggles with the lust of the eyes, right? Jesus has shown all of these kingdoms of the world that Satan has been given dominion over. The Bible says Satan is the prince of this world. Like he has kind of a dominion over these places. And, and Jesus wants these places back. He does. He wants all of these places back. And Satan's like, I'll give it to you if you just bow down and worship me. But Jesus is like, he has to be so clear in trusting God's plan and being content with what God has given him and say, I'm going to get them all back, but it's in God's timing. When I come again and I reign in the new heaven and the new earth. And then something really big happens. Let's not miss it. In Matthew chapter four, verse 11, and angels came and took care of Jesus. Now I want to break this down because we see how Jesus was tempted. If you want to know how God's going to respond to temptation, there you go. That's God in the flesh, our example. Adam and Eve, the way that I want to respond, the way that my body wants to respond. Jesus, the way that God responds to the temptation. So we can look at what God did and learn three things. Now, whenever I talk to your, your kids, I get, I get together with them in a small group, third through fifth, K through second, whatever, and we're talking. And, and I say, guys, your parents are going to come and pick you up. They're going to ask you two things. They're going to say, did you have fun? And what did you learn, okay? And the answer to the second one is not, well, I don't know. I, I know you're still getting that answer, but we're working on it, all right? I'm, I'm trying to teach them, like, tell them what you learned. Let's talk about it. But I'm asking you the same question today. What are we going to learn from God's word? Can we be prepared for that together? The first thing that I want to talk about is prepare. Our first step in facing temptation is to prepare. How do we prepare for temptation? Well, the first thing we see is Jesus goes and gets baptized. And when he comes out of the water, what happens? God speaks and said, this is my son. I'm so proud of you. Jesus was not going to go into the wilderness without knowing first who he was and that he was accepted by his father. So we come to this every single day. Before you wake up in the b b before you wake up in the morning, you're asleep. After you wake up in the morning, before you get moving on your day, am I right? Before you get moving on your day, before you go to sleep at night, maybe it's before you're in the hotel room, you're getting ready to go off to a party. Maybe it's before then. Before you go on a date with your boyfriend and girlfriend, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are in God's eyes? Do you know that you're loved, that you're chosen, that you're forgiven, that you're accepted? that you're adopted into royalty, that you've been given eternal inheritance, that you're a son or a daughter of the king of kings, that you're a light in the darkness of this world. Did you know that you, if, if you've accepted Jesus, that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? I love that Luke chapter four tells us this. So Jesus knew his identity, but he also wasn't alone. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus was accepted, he was confirmed, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do this alone. You have the one who defeated the devil with you, and he's proud of you. He's proud of you. And then finally, you guys, I have to say how Jesus prepared for this. I didn't want to go too long with this preparation idea, but the, the truth is when we're going to be confronted every day of our life with something that can take away our influence in a second, preparation is incredibly important. So I was like, I'm going to hang out here a little bit longer. Jesus was obviously fasting for 40 days. 
He was hungry. But the way I've always heard this presented is that Jesus was at his weakest when the devil came to get him. And I'm going to tell you, something just didn't sit right with me on that because the reality of it is there's no way that Jesus was baptized, was confirmed by his father, and then full of the Holy Spirit and was like, I'm going to go fight the devil and I'm going to be as weak as I can possibly be when David's eternity depends on it. Okay? That's just, that's not how Jesus works. He's smart. He's our example. Now, he was incredibly weak in his body. Let's be honest, he was hungry and he was tired, and that's never a good pair. But he'd been fasting for four days. That means that he'd been telling the Holy Spirit, yes. He created a habit of saying, spirit, yes, body, no. So Satan comes to him and is like, do this, spirit, yes, body, no. He was as strong as a human could possibly be in his spirit. And the book, Live No Lives by John Mark Comer, I just have to share that if you haven't read it, read it. It's so good. It really breaks that down in so many ways and really helped me to understand that for me, no, I don't, I don't need to fast for 40 days before I step into my day. That just doesn't work. But what I can do is I can speak verbally in the quiet hours of the morning, Holy Spirit, you have control. Body, you don't choose when I act out. Soul, you don't choose how my emotions control me. Holy Spirit, today in every action, in every conversation, I am yours. You can do that. I can do that. And now that Jesus, like he's all prepared, he's ready to go. This is where we get real. Number two, respond. How do I respond while being tempted? In the moment of temptation, when you're, when you're struggling, the answer is so simple. Just have the entire Bible memorized so that you can throw a verse out at Jesus at any, I mean, at the devil at any point in time, right? No, that's not really it. But scripture memory is incredibly important, but I wanna tell you why. Why do we teach your, your kids to memorize scripture? Because Jesus in that moment, he used scripture 100%, but more importantly than that, he used truth, okay? Jesus spoke scripture and scripture is true. That's the breakdown there that I want you to understand. Why do we want scripture in our lives? Because truth is not relative. Truth is God's word. And so I wanna be clear about this. When we face uh, the struggle of the flesh, how do we respond, all right? Lust of the flesh, here we go. This is anything that fulfills a want in your body that is in contrary to what God has said. Now, this one's tricky because the lust of the flesh isn't always a sin but it usually becomes a sin because it's out of bounds or out of God's timing. I, I want you to understand that. Rocks into bread, not a sin, not in God's timing. Satan loves to mess with God's timelines, doesn't he? He just loves to, to tempt us just outside of that. Here's an example of a, of a lust of the flesh. You're hungry. You're at work. You packed your lunch, but you're tempted to go out and eat. Anything wrong with eating out? No. But You've promised your wife that you're not going to go over the food budget, and you've already hit that cap. So what do you choose to do? You speak truth, and you say, Holy Spirit, I have self-control. I'm going to eat my lunch in the break room that I packed to honor my wife, right? That's truth. I have self-control. Another example, you're home alone, you're single, and your body just wants that person that's just a text message away. So you speak truth. God, what my body really wants is actually intimacy. I have friends that care about me and love me. I have you that cares about me and you love me. So you choose to pick up your phone and call the friend that's gonna, that's gonna build you up and encourage you, or you leave your phone at home and you go for a walk with Jesus and you say, Holy Spirit, I have self-control. Galatians 5, a gift of the Spirit, self-control. The pride of life, you step into this arrogance, anything to make me look good and get my desired outcome. You want respect at work, not a bad thing, but you believe that a promotion is what's gonna do that. So you become a workaholic and you throw your family under the bus so that you can finally receive that promotion and you don't get the respect that you wanted anyway. You use your platform that you've been gifted and the influence that you have to fill a void. This is who I am. I'm no longer David, a friend, a husband, who just happens to be a pastor at Freedom Church. I'm now David, the kid's pastor at Freedom Church, and that's my life. That's a massive problem. How do we fight that? We have to believe that with Christ, the truth that we say, with Christ, 
I am enough. With Christ, I'm what I need to be. He gives me what I need. So now you begin to struggle with envy because the lust of the eyes are powerful and you begin to want what looks nice, okay? My family's a wreck, but at least we look good. We fight the lust with the eyes, um, we fight the lust of the eyes with trust and contentment. So my family's a wreck, but I trust that if I'm honest and open about it, people are gonna come around me that will help restore my family. That's truth, all right? Because I trust that God's word is true. I don't believe that I have enough. No, God will supply all my needs. I'm content with what God has given me. So, when the devil finished tempting Jesus, he left him. But the book of Luke says, until the next opportunity came. We're not done. We fought temptation. We responded well. We prepared for it. But now we need to recover. Everybody say recover. How do I recover after being tempted? Well, angels came to tend Jesus' mortal self. And here's the crazy thing. Jesus He didn't fight it. He wasn't like, I'm the son of God. I can get better on my own. He accepted the the community that they gave to him. And then there's a story that happens right after this in Matthew chapter four. Jesus goes out and begins to handpick his disciples. I don't think that's an accident. He began to surround himself with people that he was gonna be with for the next important three years of his life before he headed to the cross. He surrounded himself with community. And for you and for me, We must accept community. God is part of that. But I wanna tell you that we share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2, okay? Galatians 6, 2 tells us that we shouldn't just have God, but we should have other people. Um, Ecclesiastes 4, 12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Ecclesiastes 4.12. Here at Freedom Church, we take this really seriously and the band can come. Every week in Freedom Kids from ages zero to 11, this is how serious we take it. We have small groups. Now you're thinking small groups with the babies. Those of you that go over and you pick up your kids and you see those little feeder tables, whatever, dude, we're putting them there for a reason. We're gonna color a picture together We're gonna pray over our Cheerios together. Like guys, we have a small group in the nursery. Pre-K, my favorite. We're herding cats over there, guys. It's so exciting. (laughs) 25 preschoolers over there in in that room. But you come over and you see these tables when you leave right there to the left, you see this, this green and this blue and this yellow table. We have a green group, a blue group, and a yellow group. It has nothing to do with splitting them up so they're easier to contain. It has everything to do with you have room to talk and be cared for by a leader. We split up your, your, your kindergarten through fifth grades by gender and by, by age so that they can learn that. And then when they join youth, they do this every week on Wednesdays. We do this on Sundays and on Wednesdays because we know it's the easiest time for you to get your kids to us and we wanna honor that and respect it. But we also do this because we believe, we firmly believe, I firmly believe, that we cannot have the relationship with Jesus that he wants us to have only in a large group setting like this. So we will never in Freedom Kids just join together in a large group and play those really fun games and call it a day. We will always give your kids an opportunity to speak, be heard and learn how to act in, in what they've learned for the day and take something home with them that hopefully they can do to bring someone to Jesus. But you're adults you get to make a choice. And I'm hoping that a choice that you make is to join a group. It would be amazing. Could you imagine if our group's attendance was more than the people that attended on Sunday? Like that would be the win, guys. Like that's the win. Groups catalog launches next Sunday. Pick a group, open up the church center app. They talk about me as the PCO guy. Open up the church center app and press the button. Like I wanna, I want to be a part of a group because this is where true recovery happens. Hard question for you, okay? Hard question. When was the last time that you responded correctly during temptation? For some of you, it's yesterday. For some of you, it's this morning. 
For some of you, you don't know the right time that you responded correctly. But you know the last time you didn't respond correctly was last night. You know the last time you didn't respond correctly was this morning, pulling into the church parking lot with one of those pre-K kids. (laughs) I know. Guys, I want to tell you that a group is where we fix that. Because the Bible says we all fall. I fail. I've failed more times than I can count. That's why I'm preaching this message today. Because I've learned that there is none righteous, no, not one, only Jesus. Everyone falls, but the righteous get back up. And how do we do that? By finding a human being, a person, having a conversation with that person and saying, I screwed up. And then they look at you and they say, I forgive you. And if a person can forgive us, how much greater is the forgiveness of our Father in heaven? And when a person comes and says, it's okay, me too, this weird thing in our bodies happens where this this shame that we feel goes away and we immediately feel loved, forgiven, open. It cannot happen without people. It can't happen. That's God's plan. It's God's design and the recovery portion. He didn't say that angels came and took care of him to show off. He said that because he needs us to know that after Satan fights you, you're exhausted and you need people to pick you back up. Jesus needed people to pick him back up. So does David. So I just wanna give you some next steps here. If that's you, Share your faults one with another. Our prayer team is gonna be available. I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come now a little early today. Start with a prayer team member. Start with your spouse, start with your best friend. Share that you have failed, but you wanna do better. Recover and then respond the right way the next time because you'll be prepared, right? And for some of you, you've heard me talk about this filling of the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus was filled with the Spirit. He went out and you're like, I don't fully understand that. I wanna share with you that we cannot win the fight against temptation. We will sin if we do not have the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way that you get that is by having a relationship with Jesus. And some of you are like, oh, that's because I've never taken that step before. I need to have a relationship with Jesus. I need to pray and simply ask him to save me and start a relationship with me. Ask him to forgive me of my sins and have a savior and begin new. Prayer team is trained to lead you in how to do that. But some of you have an even better thing. Your spouse or your best friend or your brother is sitting next to you and it's time for you to pat their leg and be like, hey, I'm ready. And they can lead you to Jesus. Give them the opportunity to lead you to Jesus right now in your seat. Can we stand to our feet today? We stand to worship. I wanna wanna share this with you. Why do we stand up when we worship? Because Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he's worth standing up for. But I wanna approach him as a friend in this moment. Why is this guy on the stage so confident that Satan's gonna tempt me and that I'm gonna fail if I don't have a community wrapped around me? I wanna tell you because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I wanna tell you that if he was for you then, he's for you now. That if he loved you that much then, then he loves you that much right now. That if he wanted to teach us how to fight temptation, then we're gonna fight it the same way right now. It's not complicated. Follow the same God. Can we talk to him together? Let's close our eyes, let's welcome him. Jesus, we believe that you are the same. We are grateful for your power. We are grateful for your kindness. We are grateful that you've met us here in this moment. And as we fight temptation today, as we fight it tomorrow, Lord, even the times we fall in sin, help us to get back up and pursue you. We worship you as the same God. You moved in power then, move in power now. In Jesus' name, amen.